print. Uh, and she notes that speech employs both acoustic and gestural forms of signals, while print text is a sequence of visual signals, right? So this page is full of things I'm looking at. They're not gesturing, and they're not acoustic yet. Um, so this clarification is reminding us that any translation of one system, say acoustic and gestural to print, is what she calls an intersemiotic translation. We have to acknowledge that that's happening that the semiotics of one system is moving into the semiotics of another and there's a translation. Second, that verbal speech has several signaling channels and that print text is received primarily through vision. Uh, so we can look at a couple of things like paralinguistics and George Traeger, uh, who wrote a book named, uh, many books, but this particular article, Paralanguage at First Approximation, talks about vocal delivery and there are aspects called vocal set vocalizations and vocal qualities. And you can imagine that there are many, many aspects there. We don't need to go into them, but to acknowledge that there are, there's actually a taxonomy there and that we could look at those three categories and the multiple options within them and how they all interact and how they actually communicate. Yes. And second of all, that um, Ray Birdwhistle has developed a parallel system of analysis called parakinesics. And that is to say all the bodily gestures that go along with all of those paralinguistics. And there are many, many again. So if you can imagine all of those variables in paralinguists and all those variables in parakinesics and how they all multiply interact with each other, that's a very complex system. And it's worth paying attention to the fact that they're there. And um, earlier I mentioned that there are these wonderful studies on trauma in oral history and the idea that, that trauma is an experience in the body and that the body can sometimes block the ability to narrate. But what I will say, uh, repeating from earlier, that the body is always present. So if you talk about silence, you're actually denying the fact that the body is speaking in that verbal silence. That there is, in fact, even in a, in a held body, by Laban movement analysis uh, perspective, that is, in fact, a body in using bound flow. That bound flow is active in the body of being held. And so maybe there's a way in which you can free that flow through mirroring and so on. But the body is present, and the body is actually communicating. So there is actually, for me, really no silence in interviews if you take into account all of the embodied channels of communication. So um, next, I just briefly want to talk a little bit about contingency. Um, first of all, we all know that oral history interviews are embedded in a social communication system. So we are intersubjectively involved with our, with our narrators. That the responses of the narrator is always emergent in regards to the questions, and that's why we record the questions. And that's why we keep the questions, because that is a dialogue that is emerging there. And so just to touch on that idea of contingency, that, and I use Bakhtin as an example, but I know that there's some in, in the people who work in those areas of um, Bakhtinian theory that Voloshinov and Bakhtin, it's not sure which person said it, because it, in the kind of Soviet era, early Soviet era, where things got mixed up. But I'll just say Bakhtin for now, that this idea of utterance theory, that in fact you cannot speak unless you're actually responding to another utterance, that is always a dialogic formation of knowledge coming from a body to a body. Right? So remember that that dialogue is not just speech, it is also the body. So that dialogic formation is contingent. It's contingent on the social situational variables of that communication system. So, so those areas of um, contingency are very important, and I, and I just want to expand that idea briefly, because I know you guys read uh, uh, Portelli and Trestuli, of course, is a text that suggests that there are many other variables in the social situation beyond the actual present bodies of the interview, that there are the family norms and values, the neighborhood social situations, and especially the church in that particular case, and statewide ideologies that all are part of those contingent variables. They're just not actually physically present. So all of those variables are contingent in this situation, and that's quite a lot going on there. So I just want to say that oral history is contingent, oral history is embodied, and then I want to just talk about how oral history is also temporal. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some philosophy. And it's, it's, you know, I'm late to philosophy, but it, it nags at me, and I feel beholden to that discipline um, to answer some questions that are, that are really important for me. So um, despite the bad rap that Martin Heidegger gets, 
because he was um, to some degree participatory in Nazi ideologies. Um, I'm going to use some of Heidegger, and I'm also going to speak uh, to Paul Ricoeur and another phenomenologist, Jan Potoshka, a Czech phenomenologist. Um, I'm going to talk about their approaches to embodied practices and temporality and how that informs the production of documentary performance. So as you know, I'm interested in not only recording the, the oral histories of performing artists, but also then using performance as a form of research inquiry to know more about the interview. So uh, documentary performance, as you may know, is uh, works that are based on several kinds of documents. And I'll get into that, but let me just introduce here the idea that um, embodiment and temporality are very important aspects of documentary performance, and especially in the case of choreography-based oral history interviews. So I'm really trying to link dance and oral history in this, in this presentation. And my talk today is framed by University of Tel Aviv Professor Freddy Rokum's conceptualization of the actor as a hyper-historian in his text, Performing History. For Rokum, the hyper-historian becomes, quote, the connecting link between the historical past and the fictional performed here and now, unquote. To accomplish this task, the actor must strengthen or reinforce the dialectics among multiple time registers in order to provide a critical perspective on both present and past events and the telling of events on stage. I suggest that Professor Rokum's articulation of the actor as a hyperhistorian can be expanded to the choreographer's role as a dramaturgical agent in revealing and making explicit philosophical comments on performance and temporality. So, to documentary theater. It's a genre of performance that relies on a variety of sources, such as photographs, drawings, paintings, prints, and other, and other notational systems. Life documents, such as correspondence, video, oral interviews, blogs, and various ephemera. And practitioners of documentary theater have a long history, but you know probably of Anna Devere Smith and Moises Kaufman and his Tectonic Theater Company, their local folks here in the city, to name just two among many who perform theatrical productions worldwide and are published in a variety of disciplines, including theater and performance studies. And if you're interested, um, Johnny Saldana's recent book, Ethnodrama, offers a, uh, a typology of types and criteria for analysis if you're interested in further look at that genre. Most scholarly studies and a large proportion of documentary theater works are focused on text-based performance. Other subgenres, such as music and dance works, and in particular where oral history interviews and choreography intersect, are relatively unexplored subgenres of documentary theater theory and practice. Nonverbal or embodied communication channels of oral history interviews can contribute vocabulary for theatrical representations of documents, including full body movements, posture shifts, limb, hand, facial gestures, as well as the physical aspects of vocal production and nonverbal vocables like laughing and coughing and crying. These embodied sources are transformed through choreographic inquiry into performance events. The few works of this choreographic subgenre of documentary theater include choreographer Mark Taylor's large-scale work title Witness, commemorating the Kent State murders of 1970, 25 years later, and my own works entitled Muscle Memory and the Sorcerer's Apprentice, S-O-U-R-C-E-R. Emerging from oral history sources documenting San Francisco Bay Area dance communities. In the latter works, the sources are mined from Legacy, an oral history program I founded in 1988, now archived at the San Francisco Museum of Performance and Design. Today I'm exploring how choreographic works based on oral historical materials are a form of inquiry that explicates philosophical approaches to embodiment and temporality as a new type of hyperhistorian. First, I'm proposing that the oral history method is a practice of what philosopher Martin Heidegger calls care, or zorga, that which expresses a person's interest in their own existence as a being in the world. Heidegger argues that care is the source of existential authenticity for human beings when we become capable of full awareness of our existence. This awareness means that we become intelligible to ourselves within the structures of the world that is given to us. Without this awareness, Heidegger suggests that we reduce our lives to an averageness that limits our capacity for full experience of living. Oral history interviewing can be instrumental in the project of existential authenticity. Further, I propose that embodied practices such as dance enable us to fully complete this awareness process. My presentation is meant to explore how existential philosophy, oral history, and dance together 
combined to fulfill our capacity for awareness through documentary performance. First, let's take a look at oral history as a particular form of historical documentary production. The oral history interview as an event is a special environment that provides possibilities for Heidegger's care. Approaching care for our existential being is accomplished through oral history because the interview is a framing mechanism that explicitly brackets the individual as a being within one's own life trajectory. That bracketing effect happens because during the interview, a person's life in trajectory is placed into relief as a timely set of events. And I use timely both in the sense of meaning meaningfulness that is produced through self-reflection, but also timely in terms of these events' temporality. The oral history interview is an exercise in temporality, that is the combination of various time tenses of past, present, and future into a single combined experience of time. This combined experience is accomplished by using the interview to reflect on one's past as it is remembered in the present. Parsing this temporality further, each of these past events is remembered as if they are present again, but thinking about the future effects of one's actions. These events become what Czech philosopher Jan Potoshka calls the quasi-past, the quasi-present, and the quasi-future. So I'm quoting Potoshka here. Humans are constantly placing themselves into situations other than the directly present ones, into the past, into the future, with all their quasi-structures. Remembering is going into the horizon of the past, where a course of life that had once been present is repeated as tokens. We move in the past as if it were present, hence quasi-present. Remember also that each quasi-present that is remembered eventually becomes a quasi-past moment in the life review and each quasi-present is associated with its quasi-future, which will then become the next quasi-present, as one continues in the self-reflection process to new points along the historical continuum. So it's basically a replacement. So the past becomes the present, and the future then becomes the present as you move forward. Of course, that means you can move back and forth in either direction. In this way, the oral history interview embeds the narrator in a continual, temporally defined way of being. And this quality of embedding oneself fully into temporality brings me back to Heidegger as existential care emerges from temporality. My next step is to then link this idea of the interview as a project of immersion into temporality, linking that immersion with action, specifically actions of the body. Heidegger argues that one's understanding of being in the world emerges from encountering objects in the world and then engaging them in a practical manner as a way of making the world. These encounters Sorry. These encounters, the world of practice, are defined by one's immersion in action, the act of doing with things and with people as we encounter them. Heidegger argues that this doing, this world of practice, is defined by temporality. Let me explain, ex explain further the connections between temporality and practice. Any action of doing in the present is driven by one's reflection on the past experience. This reflection on the past evolves into a wish, a desire, a need to do something now in the present based on your desire from the past. So any current moment of practice in the present emerges from and is informed by one's past. Simultaneously, our need to act in the present is driven by a trajectory into the future, how that wish is to be fulfilled, a desire for the projected future result of one's actions in the present. For Heidegger, when one is deeply immersed in practice, the past, present, and future all merge into an experience of full temporality. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, a Czech psychologist, has written about this embodied experience calling it flow. Where we become so immersed in the action of doing, time seems to disappear. However, for Heidegger, time doesn't disappear as much as fuse into what he calls the ecstasies of fully integrated temporality. How does this process bring us into full authenticity? We cannot have a world in the abstract. We must engage the world through practice of doing in order for the world, including its objects and other beings, to disclose themselves to us. A fully disclosed world is one in which the human being becomes fully aware of his or her being in that world, or what Heidegger calls being in the world, all one word. Historians are interested in creating a record of past actions. And these past actions include one's motivations for doing that action and then the proposed future outcomes of those actions. Therefore, Potoshka's quasi-time structure and Heidegger's temporality of being are useful models for the oral historian. Because the interview event itself frames the process of reflecting on these actions, informed by all three aspects of quasi-time, 
Oral history gives access to what Heidegger calls care, that situation in which a being becomes explicitly interested in their own being. Put another way, the oral history event places us in a situation that allows us to explicitly care about our own being as it is defined by immersion in temporality through reflection on encounters with objects and beings in the world. Now, something short about hermeneutics. How the subject of an oral history interview composes their narrative about that framed experience of care becomes a separate product, the narrative itself. This narrative is also a uniquely temporalized outcome. As philosopher Paul Ricoeur notes in his text, Time and Narrative, narratives emerge as a collection of temporalized statements about actions in the world. Ricoeur goes further to say that the narrative structure, that is how we tell the story of our experiences, is a metaphor for Heidegger's timely care. Collecting historical actions into a story structure directly references Heidegger's temporal way of being, even to the point of constructing a narrative that projects us into the possibility of authenticity. To describe this projection, Ricoeur uses the rhetorical trope of metaphor, where a descriptive image is construed in constant relationship to its reference. In the case of oral history, the narrative is the metaphor. The descriptive image for its reference is one's temporal care for being. Therefore, storytelling itself is a portal to authenticity through Ricoeur's metaphorical operation. Consequently, there is an ongoing shimmering effect between two objects. There is the constructed narrative, and there is the metaphorical reference of temporal care. In an oral history, this metaphorical effect occurs because the subject immerses itself in all three aspects of quasi-time, while at the same time reflecting on the past from the perspective of the current present. This switching of temporal codes between the present and quasi-time brings the subject into a new type of consciousness, a hermeneutic consciousness. This hermeneutic consciousness is all about interpretation, a repeated circle of sending out to the past and then returning back to the present so that one can interpret self-experience toward understanding. So I've just finished my remarks with a specific image, a metaphor that consciously evokes the shimmering movement between metaphor and its reference. I suggest that to complete the hermeneutic circle I have drawn, in order for the oral history subject to become fully aware of their care, movement must be considered. And in considering movement, there is necessarily a body that moves. For Heidegger, that being that cares about being is called Dasein. For Heidegger, Dasein is not or never had a body. Dasein exists purely at the ontological level. Since Heidegger published his work, Being in Time, many philosophers have asked this question, where is the existent body in his work? Is this philosophical treatise on existential being completely disembodied? After all, as I mentioned earlier, the centerpiece of his philosophical argument is practice. That is how one encounters the objects of the world through doing. Is not doing an embodied experience? Is not embodied experience at the core of care, and therefore at the core of our fulfillment of existential awareness? Christian Siakin, in his article for Research and Phenomenology, asks, what is the significance about the absence of the living body in Heidegger's analytic of Dasein? So I'm not the only one asking this question. Um, the author notes this absence has taken the interest of several authors. I'm not going to list them all here. Um, uh, and uh, in particular, citing Seokin, on account of this practice, we are led into an aporia, into an ontological solipsism, unquote. In his article, Heidegger and the Absence of the Body, philosopher Brian Bowles asks the same question. Bowles quotes, quotes several philosophers who has weighed in on the same concern. Sartre, quote, familiar and much repeated complaint, one cannot find six lines on the problem of the body and being in time, unquote. And so um, when I was in Frankfurt on a Fulbright, I decided to bring um, not only being in time and not only three, uh, the three volume version of Recur's um, narrative texts, but also a new text called the Zollikoner Seminar. And this to me is a really interesting text because it was a group of psychiatrists in Switzerland who were all asking Heidegger this question, where is the body? Because they found that his existential structure was actually potentially useful for a psychiatric form of somatic treatment for uh, people with existential crises. And of course, psychiat psychiatrists are interested in body. They're in engaged in the soma. So they're asking him this question. Heidegger actually went down to um, the uh, Swiss area where they were located uh, once a year for 10 years to actually just sit in a room and be peppered with their questions about what is the body. 
And um, Medard Boss, who is um, the guy who compiled all of these um, into a, uh, a text called the Zalakan or Seminary, addresses these same questions from the perspective of the psychiatric profession. Is there a possibility for the medical profession to develop an existentialist approach to psychiatric treatment? And if so, what is the role of the body in Heidegger's analytic? Heidegger responds, quote, the living body is the most difficult to think, unquote. As Siakin notes, for Heidegger, the body only appears in passing, never tackled in itself or for itself, reduced to a surprising insignificance, unquote. Did he neglect the human being capable of moving itself and setting itself into motion? Well, when I read that, you know, as a dancer, I'm really excited to see someone talking about movement in regards to Heidegger and how the body is implicated there. Um, Countering these complaints, Bowles cites Michael David Levin's text, The Body's Recollection on Being, in which the author discovers and cites notable references to the body in Heidegger's text. However, Levin admits that Heidegger's references are limited to a slightly different but important caveat on the idea of embodiment. Heidegger wants us to pay attention to the capacities of bodies rather than the fleshly experience of these bodies. I know that feels like parsing things rather thinly. But it's important. In the German language, uh, bodies are considered both live and corpor. And who, I don't know who speaks German here, but as I understand, as it has been explained to me, who does not speak German, that corpor is the actual meat, the flesh. But live is actually a, an expandable, responsive, reactionary being to its environment. It's a much more um, mobilized kind of concept about the body. Um, so. That, to me, is speaking to what Heidegger is addressing, the kind of capacities of body versus the flesh itself. Czech philosopher Jan Potoshka, who I addressed before, um, says that this dynamic body, which moves and sets itself into motion, says that it is unthematized. That is to say, we, as bodies, skip over the experience of our bodies coping with the world, those capacities, that live that we are, and focus instead on the objects and peoples we encounter. As Heidegger notes when he generates the neologism Leiben, that is, we are existing in the mode of body, or more commonly referred to as, quote, bodying forth, but only existing, but not thinking explicitly as a body. I suggest that the thematization Potoshka finds absent and is looking for occurs specifically in dance. Dancers are thinking explicitly as a body through rigorous training that develops a functional understanding of embodied practice that eventually blends into the experience of embodied thinking. Dancers train our bodies in order to know it explicitly through a series of self-analytic phenomenological experiences. For example, Potoshka calls for a better understanding of dynamism of body movement. Dance studies provides a system of observation, analysis, and notation of the over 100 possible combinations of dynamism within the Lava movement analysis system. This system of explicit dynamism organizes, informs, motivates movement in the classroom and in performance. So there is a system out there for actually explicitly thematizing dynamism in movement. Potoshka also suggests we only generally orient ourselves through the body in order to cope with the environment. On the contrary, dancers specifically orient the body within space along multiple axes, horizontal, vertical, and sagittal, and because dance movement is ultimately three-dimensional, all three axes are integrated to create a practice of what I would call hyper-orientation. This hyper-orientation in space is especially crucial in performance, where one's own body is hyper-oriented in relation not only to the theater's spatial context, but also simultaneously to other bodies similarly oriented and orienting, that is to say, changing in multiple dynamic relationships to one's own body. So let me give you one experience. Uh, when I'm uh, performing, and I step onto a proscenium stage. You can imagine there's a curtain on the side, and I'm standing here, and I'm trying to warm up something like this. And one of the things that you have to think about when you're orienting yourself in a, in a proscenium stage is not to the corners of the, of the um, stage itself, because if you're oriented to the corner, you're really kind of ignoring the audiences. You actually have to orient yourself to this larger space called the theater. So the corners of this room are my axes as, and the corner here. So I have to think of myself as projecting my body virtually into that whole space, not the limited space of the proscenium itself. Secondly, I'll just give you one experience. Um, when I was performing a work about Virginia Woolf and her milieu, um, we were using, we were multiple characters in that project, and there were four guys from, I think it was Cambridge, was it Oxford or Cambridge, I can't remember, but um, <clears throat> they were all lovers and they all sort of 
chain gang with each other in a kind of certain <laughs> young person's kind of way. And so there were several um, men doing duets across the space, and they kept moving and dynamically changing in relation to each other. Well, at one point, I was just supposed to stand at the back of the stage and throw myself up and over and be, trust that I'm going to be caught in the back. And that trustworthy person was my friend Frank, and he was always like running around here, and like when he was writing, I just knew that I was ready and I'm going to trust that he's there. I'm orienting myself to my backspace, right? So there's a hyper-orientation that you have to be aware of in relationship to the moving body that you're going to actually be caught by, hopefully, in a few seconds. Um, so in these ways, I suggest that dance explicitly frames Heidegger's coping with objects and bodies in the world. Dance clears a space of hyper-oriented and orienting disclosure of the world through explicit doing. This brings us into a fuller authenticity of being. I would also suggest that beyond dancing itself as an experience, the act of choreography is akin to the act of recur's narrative. In this way, I return to our attention to recur and narrative as a metaphorical reference to temporality. I suggest that choreography is another form of narrative construction, not focused on words, but focused on the phenomena of movement oriented in space and time. To quote Patoshka's concerns, choreography is the carefully organized framing and presentation of explicitly thematized movement dynamics. Furthermore, within its relatively short duration, choreography can be perceived as both the dancers and the audience as a highly compressed version of all three aspects of Patoshka's quasi-time. Because choreography is a temporal art, the performance is explicitly framed by its duration and time. Without the benefit of any explicit trace in the form of a sculptural object or a two-dimensional painting or drawing, dance is by definition temporal. And choreography is the art of making that temporal duration meaningful. For example, the first action presented in a choreography will always frame the rest of the temporal display that follows. The audience must retain that frame as it was first presented in order to make dramaturgical order out of the rest of the choreography. By doing so, the audience is following the choreographer's cue to experience this first framing event as the quasi-past as the choreography continues in the quasi-present. And as we have seen in my earlier discussions of oral history, each of these quasi-presents turns into a quasi-past that they accumulate as the duration of choreography goes on. The process of an audience acquiring the choreographic narrative accumulation, multiple quasi-time frames turn into Heidegger's ecstasies of temporality. This dramaturgical acquisition provides audiences of performances the same access for care for existential being as recurs narrative metaphor. Choreography is a framed experience of full temporality inscribed by thinking bodies explicitly dynamized and hyper-oriented in space. So this paper is a proposition for more exploration. The work of Heidegger, Patoshka, and Recur provide us with a framework to support a focus on embodiment of temporality in oral history-based choreography. Both oral history and choreography have the potential to bring us into full temporal consciousness and therefore disclosure of world. The combination of the oral history method and dance provide us with an opportunity for further exploration of full disclosure of human existential awareness through the choreographer as Rokin's hyper-historian. In the documentary theater production, where choreography is the primary medium through which content is framed, there are opportunities to use all the methods described above to theatrically clear a space for authentic being. Thank you. So let me just briefly mention that um, this plus is turning into the book chapter that um, Amy suggested that the memory history there. What is it? Memory History Performance um, book that's being published by uh, Paul Grave through the University of Ottawa's theater department. And tomorrow I'm flying to Buenos Aires for nine days to actually work with a choreographer uh, from Frankfurt when I was in Frankfurt. Um, an Argentinian choreographer um, requested my mentorship on oral history, creating choreography. She made an amazing work. She made a work with a uh, a German choreographer who had since died, who had immigrated to Argentina uh, before World War II. And she actually worked with um, secondary interviews, about a dozen secondary <coughs> interviews. And what she found out is that the mythology of this choreographer, whose name is Renata Chotelius, was that she did one thing, but in fact, with the interviews, she discovered that this person did completely other things. So there was an interesting problem there. And what was wonderful about the work that she created is it was a choreography about that gap 
between the mythology and, in fact, what was generated through the archival process of oral history interviews. So what, what is most interesting for me in the, in the um, project, again, using Rokum's um, framework, were the various theatrical modes in which she was enabling us to perceive gaps. So, for example, the first thing you see in the performance is actually a, a print, period print dress of that, like the six, 50s and 60s, and it's hanging at, at person height, but it's completely flattened on a cardboard. And the soloist, the only performer in the, in the piece that dances, comes up. Can you still see me if I go here? <laughs> yeah? So here's, here's the dress. And she comes up and she is like trying to become three-dimensional with this dress. So the, the perception is that there's a two-dimensionality two that cannot achieve three-dimensionality. And that the gap between the living body and the flat body are not possible. That's not commensurable. And so that's the first thing you actually experience is the gap between those. The other, um, among other, the, the, the one that I think is most interesting is where she has videotaped an interview and she places it on a video uh, monitor downstage and then the soloist is actually behind that video monitor trying to perform every movement that that, that narrator is doing. And obviously it's impossible for her to sync that up. It's always behind or ahead or not quite exactly the same movement, so that gap is clearly there. Um, and what, what she's done, the choreographer has done, is she's actually edited that uh, interview so that every time there's a abrupt edit, the, the soloist actually scrapes her chair back and has to start over. So she gets further and further behind, both temporally and spatially. So that by the time, I mean, screech and screech and like this, and you, it's like you're tearing this suturing that you think happens between this performance and this video monitor is being like, it's like ripping off tape off of a wound every time. By the time she's finished, she's in the back of the performance desperately trying to fulfill this gap that has not actually been fulfillable. So there are several theatrical uh, choreographic ways in which she's actually pointed to this gap. And in that way, I think she's really fulfilling this hyper-historian as choreographer aspect that I'm looking at. So I'm um, actually giving another paper down in Buenos Aires next Thursday on Thanksgiving. Uh, before that fourth performance. So just to say there's yet more going on with this idea. Yeah, Amy. Can you talk about in your own work choreographing yeah. dance pieces based on or drawing from oral histories? Mm -hmm. um, how you, just how you dealt with the embodied temporal experience mm -hmm. of the oral history yeah. um, and the embodied temporal experience of the dance performance and the, mm -hmm. the gaps and differences right. between them? Yeah. Well, there's a particular uh, section of, of my work called Muscle Memory where Frank, who I mentioned, who I was about to leap into his own. Um, <clears throat> Frank had HIV AIDS, and when I interviewed him, that was part of the process. And Frank, as I mentioned earlier in the pre-interview, um, was had an opportunistic virus that caused him to develop dementia. And I said to Frank, would you like to stop? He said, no, I want you to actually document this process of me losing my mind. So I did. And actually, for me, that was one of the most core and powerful aspects of the interview. And so I did actually construct a, a part of the work which deliberately um, mixes different periods of the interview. So I am specifically meaning to be um, confusing. But, uh, so for example, uh, Frank, uh, when he was HIV AIDS and decided to retire at the age of 26 from this dance company, he was, a uh, the choreographer created a solo for him, a beautiful solo named Sweet William, in which he reveled in himself. And at the same time, he talks about in the oral history that while he was performing that last performance, all he could think of was his whole life trajectory at the same time. <coughs> um, so there was that experience of describing that performance and that reflectiveness on it. So like you know, time, past, quasi-past, quasi-present. Um, also, um, Frank, um, his mother, who was a biker babe from New Jersey, came to visit and take care of him. And Joyce didn't actually know where the hospital was, uh, where he had all this treatment. And one, night, one morning, Frank woke up paralyzed from the waist down. And he said, I'm in a panic. I don't know what to do. And Joyce said, where do we go? I said, I go to the hospital. But he couldn't remember either where the hospital was. So there was this driving escapade up and down the hills of San Francisco looking. They were weeping. And it was terrible. Uh, and then also, Frank, uh, in his heyday, uh, 
was also uh, in a ballet company where he performed a solo by Anna Sokolow called Panic. So there were these interesting ways in which these aspects of the, of the narrative were intertwined with this idea of panic. And um, so I actually selected elements, and then I mixed them so that they kept shifting into one another. So they kept shifting between different temporalities within the narrative, and then choreographed that so that it was given um, in a way that was, I'll call it quasi-coherent. And it was meant, actually, to be not quite coherent. And I think that was the point of the performance, was to give that um, process. So that would be one example that I think of. Yeah. I have to admit that the word performance in oral history um, is kind of, it's kind of scary. It's one that I mm. try to avoid, because mm. I think of performance as not authentic. Mm. So it definitely influences the way that I mm interact with my narrative, my decision not to use video, because I don't want them mm -hmm. to perform, because mm -hmm. in my mind it would take away from the yeah. truth. Yeah. So, but when I started becoming more familiar with your work, mm -hmm. just by reading the essays that you yeah. suggested, mm -hmm. I immediately started thinking, well, how in this realm of theater, in this realm of performance, can we combat the issue of not always getting the authentic story of maybe getting the fantastical or the mm -hmm. exaggerated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and so I was wondering, in, in your essay just now, you mm -hmm. were mentioning mm -hmm. the hyper-historian mm -hmm. and, and that connection between history and fiction. Mm -hmm. So do you even feel the need to try to challenge the performance and mm -hmm. the aspect of mm -hmm. exaggeration that comes with that? Well, first I want to recognize that, that concern, because that's an important concern that people start performing for the camera and not really giving an I think that in some ways I'm lucky in that the cohort I was focused on are a group of people who are professional performers. And so I have to say that for me at least, and many of my colleagues in performance, once they're not on the stage, the last thing they want to do is perform. So it's almost like a retreat from that world. And the other thing I'll say is that, I don't know if you've had this experience, but you know, when you're, when you're on stage getting ready and the curtain's closed and some, the, the booms are coming down, the curtains are moving, and you're trying to like just do your plie, and just focus, you get really, really good at just doing what you're doing and not worrying about all the stuff around you. That, and so if there's lights and there's a camera, actually the, that particular cohort is really actually good at being themselves in that place because they're practiced in that world. But I would also say that there's nothing wrong with the fantastical. You know, what is oral history? It, it's a subjective slice. It's partial by definition. And it is intersubjective. We use that word, right? And so let's admit that. Let's live inside that. Let's allow that to be. So if that's what you're getting, that's what you're getting. And so you know, it is necessary for us to look at the interpretation process and sort of note what the conditions were under which it was performed, and you know, talk about the the, the biography and how that might have been interacted with it. But that's real too. That's real too. There's no one truth, so far as I'm concerned. I'm speaking for myself. Yeah. Um, your your work is very much stimulating to me because I'm I'm, I'm a big music fan and so mm -hmm. and the fact that you're using dance to tell these stories, mm -hmm. I'm curious as to your methodology when selecting music. Are they all original scores? Mm -hmm. Are they they are they popular music? Mm -hmm. And if so, how exactly are you coordinating this so mm -hmm. it's in I guess in sync with the dance and the yeah. movement of the body so that it's yeah. telling this comprehensive oral history. Yeah. Well, I'll speak from two perspectives. One, for my own work. Um, in Muscle Memory, uh, there is no music, per se, but there are recordings. And the recordings are an actor's uh, rendition of some edited versions of the oral history. But they are also coached. They are um, dramatized, so that there's one section which I ask the person. <laughs> so another uh, interview was with a, an elder in her late 80s uh, who had a wonderful, amazing life, who danced in New York with a choreographer named Heine Holm. Uh, so this woman was born of Polish parents in San Bernardino, California, and had to run away from home to be a dancer. And she finally got to New York by driving an elderly educator across the United States in her 44 Packer at 40 miles an hour. And she wanted to stop at all these college campuses to just <laughs> soak it in. And it was very frustrating for this young person who wanted to start her career. So she was like, come on, come on. So when she got there, she was immediately met by her brother, and she said goodbye, and now we're going to Honey Home Studio, and he said, now you're going to audition. 
So her life went like, like that. There was an acceleration to it. So I wanted to actually ask the actor to dramatize the accelerate. Well, first the slowness, and that was slow, and then it gets a little faster, and then it actually moves quite quickly in a kind of geometric way towards acceleration. When she actually auditions for Hanya Home, the day she arrives after driving for two weeks in a packer, and she gets the job. And it was a transformational moment in her life. And that acceleration is a part of the dramatization of the text, which is recorded. In terms of music, um, let me give you a couple examples. Uh, Paula Rosalyn is the Argentinian choreographer I mentioned, who's doing work in uh, Buenos Aires. Um, she actually uses uh, Renata Chatelius's signature work, which is named Aria, which is to a Bach Aria. And she asks a um, piano player to be on stage, and he actually plays selected dots of the Bach music. So it's never continuous. He plays it exactly as it would be rhythmically, but he drops out certain aspects of that. There's a, there's a composer named Lucas, Lucas Foss who's done something similar as well. So there's a way in which he's using it to, to point out the kind of partiality of the, of the narrative that we only get at certain points, but not everything. Um, so that's another example. There are actually music-based oral history performance projects. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. One is the, um, uh, A Survivor of Warsaw by Arnold Schoenberg, in which he takes what might be apocryphally a first or second person narrative of someone who survived the Holocaust, and he actually recreates that in orchestral form uh, and so, for example, the Nazis are coming and saying, like, everyone line up. And so he uses the brass instruments in the orchestra to suggest lining up. And then the vocal parts are what we call Sprechstimme. And I think in some ways this work was considered the, the sort of first real work of Sprechstimme, which is speak singing. And so the speak singing is, is rhythmatized as if it's a form of music. So there's that. And then there's a wonderful work um, by Steve Reich named Different Trains, which you may be aware of, in which he... Um, interviewed people while he was a child living in the States who would have been as old as children who might have been murdered in the Holocaust. And he saw that connection. And he uh, was also a child that shuttled between divorced parents. And so he felt like he could have been on a train, just the way those kids were on a train going to the camps. And so the idea of different trains is the work. And he actually did interviews with his governess who accompanied him back and forth. He also interviewed uh, African-American porters uh, on the trains about the experience of being on trains. And he also took interviews from um, a Holocaust oral history project. What he did was he looked for what he calls psychoacoustic fragments, in which something meaningful emerges in the rhythm or the timbre of the, of the, vo of the voice in the interview. So for example, uh, the porter said, when we got to New York, OK, so when we got to New York has a rhythm to it. And when he actually set the music on the Cronus Quartet, he actually took the rhythm of that. Da -da 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 -da. Da -da 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 that sounds like a train, right? So that was quite interesting in that actually the words come forward in a, in a recorded tape, but we also hear the Cronus Quartet playing live, the same rhythm. And there are ways in which those, what he calls psychoacoustic fragments, are ways of tapping into um, the, the body qualities of the words to bring them into music. So that's another example of pure music situation. Yeah. Do you provide notes that discuss some of the ideas behind uh, presentations for those who are not adept at reading the movement or, or interpreting the movement? Ah, very good. You mean in the transcripts of an interview? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for me, the best case scenario is if in an interview someone uses movement. And I gave this example earlier, so I'll just give it again. That I was talking to a choreographer, and he said, when I do my choreography, this is what, you know, I do these certain things, and what, what is that? So I waited, and then I asked him, okay, you did this. Gesture, can you tell me more about that? And, you know, the ultimately open-ended question. He said, oh, that's the crown chakra, and I use the chakra system to do all my choreography. Let me give you a whole methodological treatise on the seven chakras. So it was clearly important, but it was embedded. And so my best case scenario is going back to the narrator, giving them a cue, at most the minimal cue to give them that open to say what they can say. Let them say it in their own words. That's my best case scenario. Um, when I'm describing that movement in text, right, I'm trying to give some kind of um, 
you know, strong descriptive elements. You know, he touched his hand with his, you know, vertically with the fingers of his right hand, kind of something like that. But ideally, we shifted from uh, sound recording to video recordings in, in all of our interviews in order to cope with the, just these issues. But I will answer the question in another way that maybe you didn't intend. Um, I actually uh, wrote about muscle memory and uh, rewrote that published text as a performance script. So that actually I included all of the enters, exits, props, movements kind of thing. And what I did is I deeply footnoted all of those. So there's actually more footnotes on the page than text because I really wanted to make the point about kind of the ironies of what text does to performance to the body in print and try to see how it, show how it colonizes it. So that was kind of the ironic text there. Yeah. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Sorry? A quick oh, follow of course, yeah. Uh, so if one of these was to go to an actual performance, yes. would you provide the audience with some of the background uh, ideas? No. Okay. <laughs> I like the performance to stand on its own as a work of art. I, I'm giving this lecture on the fourth performance of Paola's Run. She did it every Thursday night in November. So many people have seen the work already, and if they want to come back and listen to that after the fact, that's great. There will be some people who will hear it before that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I'm really so excited to hear your thoughts and ideas. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm really interested in the word authenticity yeah. and how you define it. And I'll, I'll just give you, rather than ask you on the spot, I'll give you a hint about why I'm interested. Um, I usually assign Jeffrey Hartman's book, Scars of the Spirit, uh, towards the struggle against inauthenticity. So my class this year, I did not, because some of the readings were very abstract. Um, but as a supreme word for a scholar, but also more importantly, a survivor of the Holocaust and a writer uh, for the School of Critical Theory on the Holocaust, and the co-creator of the Holocaust Fortune of Archive at Yale, which was the first organized oral history of Holocaust center in the country. Hartman, like Whitman, in a certain kind of way, believes against the idealization of what is and also what could be the progress because of the experience of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And so I'm super interested because I know that if you're using that word authenticity, it has real meaning and it maybe perhaps has more meaning in the body, I'm thinking about the body and embodiment than it could in a text, which Bertman is focused on, right? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I'm very appreciative of his, um, his ability to push himself and all of us doing documentary work to question whether there is anything like authenticity after the Holocaust or after Rwanda. And I'm thinking of the work of uh, Rashid Wanuddin also as a way of his working with torture as, as something you can't I mean, the way he performs it is something you can't quite get beyond. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what you're thinking about those kinds of things. Yeah, it's a, it's a key word with many vexed problems associated with it. And you know, in postmodernism, people would say there is no authentic self because we're all splitting ourselves frequently and we are all simultaneously many, many beings. And I would certainly agree with that. And I would say that um, that's some of the problems, some of the criti critiques of Heidegger's work is that he was embedded in a kind of pre-modern nostalgia for the kind of um, agricultural vogue of the German time. And you know he's deeply criticized for that because it actually also is part of his um, Aryan and even Nazi mm -hmm. ideologies. So those have been some of the problems, that he was looking for the, the artisanal, the kind of craft person in the world that seemed to be overcome completely by the Industrial Revolution. That was driving, in many ways, what he was trying to do. Um, I guess what I would say is that I'm, I'm interested in the way in which the temporality aspect can be separated out from the ideologies. Right. And you know, right now, I'm actually reading a text on Heidegger and Nazism just to ask myself this exact question. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a pursuit that I have, and I'm well aware of the problems. And more and more um, information comes forward, it seems, annually about the problematics of Heidegger and his ideological stuff. So I'm asking myself, can I use it? Uh -huh. Can I use it in any way that is helpful for me? Well, what I was intrigued by is the possibility that, that through embodiment, mm -hmm. you can talk about it in a different kind of way mm -hmm. than you would talk about it in terms of ideology. Mm -hmm. that's, what's, that's what you provided me to 
Yeah, and that's for me the most interesting thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a question. My, my background is in psychogeography, as it were. I was a performance artist, and you said specific theater, and I've never really thought of oral history introspecting, oh, so yeah. I appreciate what you're saying. And yeah. I have a question which sounds to me quite nutty. You talked about um, temporality and silence, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking of a durational performance piece by Marina Abramovich, The Artist is Present, mm -hmm. which was that MoMA and is now a movie, the, uh, uh, the Artist is Present. It's a very significant title when you talk about mm -hmm. the bond, the bound body. She sat there, for mm -hmm. those who haven't seen it, for over 700 hours and did nothing, mm -hmm. in some people's terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My question is, in your terms, mm -hmm. does that constitute oral history? Mm -hmm. Her the completely gestural interaction. Mm -hmm. Such an interesting idea, because it's non, it, there's no vocal dialogue, but there's actually all the, all the embodied channels of communication are then highlighted as a result of that. And it's and it, documented you know, live. Yeah. And do I remember that people would come up and sit? Yes. Mm -hmm. And be interacted with her. In fact, even her lover, who she hadn't seen in decades, right? <laughs> yes, up, right? and there was no parameter on the time frame. You would yeah. sit there yeah. as long as the guards mm -hmm. let you. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a really interesting idea. Yeah, I think it, it goes. It takes my my concept and pushes it to this extreme. Well, it's pretty illogic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I also think that site specific work is quite interesting because, in fact, you are, and because my background is in architecture, that has been actually a, a focal point of my choreography is site specific work. And for me, there's always a way in which I'm in dialogue with the site, with mm -hmm. the geography of the site, and how do you unleash what's embedded there culturally and also temporally in terms of the historical materials. I did a work on the um, on the water's edge of San Francisco at the Maritime Museum in which the the uh, the, the celebration of the of the tall ships era of maritime culture in San Francisco uh, was being was being documented and, and housed there. And um, we learned sea chanties. And uh, we we learned the singing, we also learned the movement associated with sea chanties. Um, and we actually walked into the water and submerged ourselves and so on. And it was a, it was a year's work of, of going to the museum and learning about what was embedded in the site. And also what's embedded in the site is the, is the historical oppression of, of Asians who were brought through those ships to the port and what, they, what was done to them. And to sort of use, for example, some of the symbolics of mourning with the color white and um, uh, certain aspects of actually feng shui, which is a, a form of site analysis in Chinese culture. So there's all kinds of ways in which I was trying to unearth what was there in the site and be in dialogue with it. Ron. I'm kind of intrigued by <coughs> in the, the story you told at the end mm. about trying to make something that's two-dimensional into yeah. three dimensions. Yeah. Yeah. In a sense, that's what we try to do in an interview. Mm. We're presented with a body of evidence, a narrative, etc., 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 that is always, in some sense, <clears throat> two-dimensional, or th it's three-dimensional. But we have our language is such, the language of history is such that it's difficult to make it to give it that third mm -hmm. di dimension or that multi-dimension. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily be third. Yeah, and that. Uh, uh, we strive for the proper language to do that. And part of that is a striving to understand the different temporalities involved in, say, the dress, the mytho mythological image or, mm -hmm. of the dress mm -hmm. contains within itself mm -hmm. a different kind of temporality than the one we are used to as a historic yes. in terms of the way we measure time, the metrics we put upon it. Mm -hmm. and so that it's that tension yeah, right. between, the, then the question is, for the apparatus that you've worked on, mm -hmm. is how does our understanding of the text of the tensions lead us to make judgments about action in the real world? Mm -hmm. And that's, where you, you're calling upon Heidegger and mm -hmm. Berkur mm -hmm. to make that transition. Mm -hmm. It's, in, in terms of, first of all, in terms of the question, I'm not sure it's, it's a really important issue. Mm -hmm. And I'm not so sure 
it works. Mm -hmm. the, the, the way in which metaphor becomes evidence is a very, very tricky, uh, tricky problem. And uh, you know, I'm trying to figure out using that last story mm -hmm. as an entryway into what I just heard, not read. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that if I read your essay, I would understand what you're saying in a much different way than hearing. Yeah. Sure. So I like that image of yeah. two dimension, three dimension, mm -hmm. multi dimension. Yeah. Well, I don't know if this helps, Ron, but what's interesting about metaphor for me is that it is a vibration between the thing itself and its reference. And what the reason I use it is that then that vibration introduces the concept of movement. That the, that the metaphor is not lifeless, that it actually has this shimmering effect. Because you must actually hold both of those at the same time in your mind in order for that operation to work. And in order to hold them both, you actually have to hold your attention to both poles and then go back and forth very quickly between them to kind of wrap them, I guess, in a way. And it's interesting that you know when I actually did this gesture with the dress, there was a way in which she was trying to wrap herself around it. So I don't know if that's actually helpful for you, but to me that it was a it was a figure that was meant to move us towards how movement is always embedded in our rhetorical tropes. And that movement, the reason why we even have that movement sensibility is because we have bodies. So I'm trying to pull down the, the, the rhetorical world into the body from which it emerges. But our existential problem is that the historical trope is embedded in the movement, mm -hmm. as well as the movement being and I don't mind that at all, because then that's actually more, more ways for us to move, to mobilize, actually. So, but thank you for that. I expected you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I've, I've been enjoying this discussion on theory, um, mm -hmm. but I'm curious, we've been talking in our program about one of the more sort of practical concerns in doing oral history mm -hmm. and the arts, which is more about funding, oh. mm -hmm. um, and how you are able to sort of execute these projects. Yeah, that's a good question. That's <laughs> 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 yeah. um, Well, in, in the 80s, right, I went to the NEA during the period of time in which HIV AIDS was very apparently an issue. I, I was invited to Dance USA, which is the service organization for our field, and uh, to speak. And I would always say, whenever I spoke at that time, I'm not a historian, but this is what I do, to the point where I kind of asked myself, I could be a historian. So then I went to <laughs> graduate school. Um, but I felt that there was a sense of regret in the community for not having really paid attention. And they felt that they wanted to honor those of us who were trying to pay attention in the documentary ways or other ways. Um, as a result, I at least became uh, more than a nameless face. I became at least a face with a name in that national world of the funding community. So that when I requested funding, at the very beginning, I received $5,000 uh, from the NEA to do one of a couple of these projects. Um, the next year, the NEA withdrew its money, even though I applied, of course. And then uh, someone told me that David Geffen was shed, shed, uh, developing a foundation. And I thought, okay, I'll call him up. So I called him up. And um, I, I think only his, like his secretary or assistant answered, and he was like on the phone saying, David, what do you think? And, got, and I could hear like faintly, what does he want? Said, well, it's $5,000. Okay, give it to him. <laughs> so I just had the balls to do that. That was, and he replaced the entire NEA with one grant. Um, so it was that kind of thing that once you're in in the granting procedure and you actually are decent about doing your reporting, which is really important uh, because word gets around because it's a very small community. If you do your decent reporting and you, and you have decent projects, you actually can get funded. And I had, I think I received eight national endowment for the grant for the arts grants in various categories, wherever they were, um, in services, and then I think it was, I don't remember what it was actually, services to the field for a long time. In any case, 
Uh, I also received funds from the California Arts Council. And in particular, it was because I did a, uh, an outside evaluation of the program, of Legacy's program and its materials, about, mm, let's see, that was 92, five years in. And I brought in an anthropologist who did oral history who was involved in dance. And she did an outside evaluation, we published it, and we sent it along with our applications. I felt like I was doing as much due diligence as I could to prove that I was serious about being evaluated, taking advice. One of the advice points, and we used it actually in our application, was that it was not sufficiently diverse. So we spent four years actually doing interviews with Cambodian dancers and Capoeira dancers and Native American dancers and Mexican American dancers, which were amazing, amazing interviews, and I was so grateful for that. But I do think that um, thinking, um, what's the word I want to say, strategically, about how it is that you will be seen from the outside and using whatever tools you have to justify and uh, kind of solidify what it is you're doing and then use those recommendations to then launch a new grant proposal. So that actually worked for several 15 years, I would say. Um, then it became quite difficult and then the challenge was is how to up the ante. And the way we up the ante was being very challenged by my archive is why aren't we doing more famous people? And so what we did is we devised a, a, a strategic plan that we would do what was quote unquote, well, an elder who was well known, a, a, the first ballerina in San Francisco Valley to do the Nutcracker in the 30s, something like that, great lady. Uh, it turns out that she was the mentor for the first Hispanic prima ballerina in San Francisco Valley, pretty much in the nation, who was younger, not at risk, but had an amazing story, but she was her student. So there was a relationship there and there was this amazing, not famous, flamenco dancer who was a dentist who performed flamenco in the tablao uh, of, the, of the North Beach area of San Francisco. And he had an amazing story too. And he was actually a friend of the first prima ballerina because they went to the San Francisco Valley School together in the 30s. So what I was looking for always was a triangulation between a person that was well known someone with whom they had a relationship, and then someone who was not well-known who had a relationship to both, because he was also Filipino. So it was, it was establishing even more uh, Hispanic or, or Latin-based um, characters in the, in the narrative pool. So that was an example, and we went on to do more like that, actually. And I think that that triangulation worked well as a next stage strategy in order to generate continued funding. And then what was good about that is it was three interviews, and we got three years of funding. And then we got three more years of funding for the next trend. So that was a good six years then. That was quite good. So we really were very thoughtful about how to be responsive to you know, our board of directors and the archives, and how to also be, um, uh, what's the word, um, immersed within our own uh, principles and value systems of risk factor being the most important aspect. So that was one solution, I would say. In terms of making performances, Did I ever get funding for those performances? No, I did not. I made them on my own. But what I will say is once I made them, it became the engine that ruled my solo career. Because what happened is I could go to uh, Carlisle, Carlisle uh, no, Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, give a lecture on oral history, anthropology, sociology, give a, a, a lecture demonstration to theater, teach in a dance, class and then bring all those um, audiences together for a performance. And I did that in Dickinson, I did that in Idaho, I did that in New Mexico, I did that in Pennsylvania. So it was actually the, the engine for my touring career because I could generate earned income because I could justify me by myself being able to serve all these different um, aspects of the same university community. And you know that was the case I made for a good eight to ten years. So it wasn't uh, it was earned income, not donated income, in that case. Does that help answer your question? That's great. Thank yeah. You. Mm. Funding, yeah. And that's, that's great, thank you. Um, and thinking more about this relationship between temporality and embodiment in the oral history interview, mm -hmm. and, and I'm interested in the idea that, that our bodies are sort of 
stuck in time in a way, right? We're in our bodies in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and in an oral history interview, we're talking in the quasi-past, the quasi-present, the quasi-future, moving all around in, right. our, in our minds yeah. through time. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, because of your training, I think you have a special mm -hmm. ability to observe the way our bodies act in oral history. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you have anything to say about how our, our bodies and our body language mm -hmm. reflects those movements through time mm -hmm. as we're talking mm -hmm. in, in the oral history mm -hmm. interview, mm -hmm. mainly for narrators, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, my doctoral dissertation looked at one of the interesting, well, one of the interesting things to emerge from the research was that people uh, are more often narrating recursively than we think they are. And by recursive, I mean that they return to certain nodes of importance. And so, uh, for example, one of my interviews was with a, a narrator from the Trial of Dark Company, actually during 9-11, bless his heart, he and his wife, did two interviews before and then two interviews the day after and the day after. And I had to get to Brooklyn to do them, which was amazing. But um, he uh, was very engaged with this idea of self-reflection, and he had certain nodes in his history that were very important ones. And I consider them what I would call stable elements of a mobilized life trajectory. So in the Lava Movement Analysis System, one of the main paradigms is stable mobile. And that is to say, if you're, if you're actually moving your arm, it's not just moving your arm, you're actually stabilizing this side of your body in order to do that, because if I didn't, I would do that. So there's a way in which we are always, to some degree, walking is an exercise in stable mobile, stable mobile. And so that paradigm actually is a, a very helpful overall sensibility about what movement is. And what I noticed for him is that when he would recurse back to these nodes, he would actually do these amazing, this is just one gesture, in which he would do this stable, stable, mobile gesture. And so that, that was something that, in terms of body language, was a cue for me. What's going on here? The same way I'm asking, what's going on there? This is something he did frequently. And so I had to check, okay, where is that occurring in the interview? Well, what I noticed, it's where he would recurse back to a stable node in his own life trajectory. So there was ways in which that body language was referring to the temporal structure of his, neck, of his life narrative. Did that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, That's one example. I just want to hear more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you another example. Another Twyla Tharp dancer actually um, said to me in the interview, well, she didn't say it to me. She said, I'm now speaking to my future audience. <laughs> Very rare, right, for a narrator to, to have that kind of perspicacity to think about how this interview will be in perpetuity available to future audiences. And this was a Harvard-trained historian who turned into a dancer, and she had this amazing sense of her own temporality. And in fact, as a result, because it was being uh, videotaped, she actually performed the interview, speaking of performance. She said, now I'm going to sit on the floor and now you're going to sit on the floor. And now we're going to sit back to back while you interview me. Now we're going to sit front to front. And now we're going to lean to the side. Pretty soon we were doing contact improvisation <laughs> during the last bit of the interview. So this was absolutely her saying to future audiences how the body and the sense of the narrative is actually intertwined completely. And it was for the future. It was quite incredible. There were some other I, I just had a question. I've been having this internal debate about meaning making. I hope this question comes across as clear. But since you're interviewing choreographers mm -hmm. uh, for your oral history, mm -hmm. how exactly is that meaning making made clear? And is there a conversation between you and the, your interviewee as to what movement should be representative of what they're saying and things of that nature? Is that clear? Sort of. I'm interviewing all kinds of people in the dance community. I think of it as a dance economy, so I could be interviewing an administrator or a teacher or a dancer or a choreographer or even a musician. So there are many, many roles, and actually, as you may know, dancers in the room, many of us occupy all of them at the same time or across our life trajectory. So I would just say that there are many roles. That's just one thing. But I think you're asking, how, in terms of my meaning making, my interpretation of the interview, how I'm selecting what movements? Mm -hmm. Or is that like a, a two-person job where you're an interviewee and you guys have a conversation about it, or the interviewee dictates, okay, I want this movement to uh, say, this, say this. I see what you're saying. No one has ever been that explicit with me, except okay. that one person who actually decided to choreograph the whole interview. <laughs> that, was the, that was the sort of 
extremist version of that. So I would say they almost often happen subconsciously, and my job is to actually make them explicit. And so I'll ask the question, what was that? And I would say in general, maybe you were here for that, that almost always when I ask, it has been very fruitful, that there has been a whole narrative emerging out of that gestural moment. So I would just say that for them it's often subconscious, but I make it explicit. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, yeah, sorry. But I think keeping your eye open to the possibilities, because you could ask and they would say, oh, that doesn't mean anything, and that's fine. It's also fine. But almost always it, it, it sends us somewhere. Could you talk a little bit about your own body as you are doing these interviews mm. and your awareness of it and mm -hmm. how maybe um, how that has changed as you've become more and more experienced in interviewing? Oh, the interviewer's body. Yeah. I'm just looking at the position. Oh, yeah, I'm doing fifth position on the <laughs> table. <laughs> 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 I'm willing to go most places where the narrators want to go. And so I'll just give an example where I was interviewing a guy with HIV who was Filipino and Hopi and had grown up on the, uh, the work camps of the Central Valley of California. And his father came with his two young sons, left the mom at home. And the two kids stayed at home. And what they would do, he told me that they would put on, when his dad went to work, they would put on um, I guess it was 60s or 50s sort of Elvis music, and they would actually dance with the um, with the doorknobs as their partners. And so he would get up, he got up and demonstrated that. And I said, "Can you show me?" And I'll do it, right? And there was a way in which my being willing to go there was a way of deepening that experience and validating it for that person. And then, you know, we actually danced together for a little while to see what that was like. And then we sat down and let me say the narrative just kept spilling out of that experience. So I'm willing to go there if it's necessary. In the same way, I think I described being part of the performance of Anna Halpern's ritual, you know, for a week, <laughs> being enmeshed in this improvisational uh, structure in order to gain an understanding inside that performance to do the appropriate interviews. I'm go I'll go there. I'm willing to go there. In terms of just the practical elements of doing an interview sitting in a chair, I'm, I'm just always aware, hyper aware maybe, of where they're comfortable or not comfortable and how I can have them be more comfortable. And sometimes I do use some of those things that we learned in the 70s about nonverbal communication, that you can sometimes mirror somebody and make them comfortable. Sometimes you can actually do something that's not a mirror that actually helps them move. So this would be sagittal movement, front and back movement. This person is laying back the whole time. They're very relaxed, but actually they're not very engaged. So if I actually do something in the sagittal, in the front, sometimes that is automatically brought into their bodies and they come forward to me and engage me. And I use those elements. So that's another practical side of the interview that I'm aware that I have capacity for doing. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, it's great. It makes me wonder also about um, what you're talking about with silence and mm -hmm. how there is no silence, and mm -hmm. um, and maybe as mm -hmm. you're mirroring or engaging, um, mm -hmm. creating a blankness for that opening in some sense, and and how that works with silence. Yes, the flow thing that we talked about earlier. I might put a tiny what's called shape flow in lab on movement analysis. Shape flow is just when you are kind of flowing inside your own body's container. Mm -hmm. I might do that as a little bit of a cue for someone who feels bound. I try not to be manipulative. <laughs> Somebody once suggested we use rolling chairs. <laughs> <laughs> so we can lean in and then yeah, lean yeah, in. Yeah, and yeah, fly yeah. around the room. Yeah. Well, that was what Teresa really did. She basically went there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in one of the essays um, that I read in preparation for this, you discussed this idea of like, performance as a form mm -hmm. of research inquiry. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're a writer, you're a dancer. Mm -hmm. um, so would you mind comparing stage performance uh, and scholarly writing as ways of interpreting oral history? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a big question. 
Let me start with an example and that might be illustrative for you. When I first wrote about muscle memory for publication, I talked about uh, this elderly woman, Eve, and um, she was very small for her age, and she was taken to school by her brother, and the teacher says, no, she can't be old enough. She can only be four, maybe five, and she, was, and, and she said, I'm six, I'm really six. And so they brought the teacher back to the home, and the parents who were Polish immigrants could not cope with the status difference. So they allowed uh, the teacher to, in, to intimidate them so that this child who was old enough to go to school didn't go to school for a year. So that was a very sad thing. She actually, uh, the child saw her parents abjected by the power uh, uh, in the status of the teacher. And so I wrote about it, but I didn't think about the body, of how the body itself might have shown that abjection. And so my uh, professor actually asked me to explore that as a core element in movement terms. What would it mean to be abjected? Would you shrink? Would you stand behind your mother? Would you look at your mother? Would you shrink and look at your mother? What's the body experience of doing that? And that enabled me to actually get into a whole discussion of power relations, power relations between the child and the parent, power relations between the parent and the teacher, how the teacher might have become more like a parent to the child, making the parents into children, and maybe the, the daughter actually mirrored the abjection of the parent becoming a child. All of these complexities were actually coming out as a result of my actually moving through that process of being that abjected child or experiencing that situation in a performance way. So if that makes sense, that was a form of inquiry that got me into this whole array of potential power dynamics that I hadn't really addressed in the print text yet. And then when I rewrote the text, I wanted to reverse that sense of the, the performance being more important than the text, so I put all the text in the footnotes. So that was a way of reversing the power of the scholarship and the performance. Did that make sense? Yes. Okay. So that's one example. There are others. Um, you know, I perform Frank. I still perform Frank. Um, you know, he had a... Um, Frank was a snap queen. Do you know what a snap queen is? Oh, yes. Okay, who's a snap queen? What is it? Okay. Oh, okay, I really know my definition. Yeah, of sure. Snap queen. Go for it, yeah. I, I watched Tums and Tie, mm -hmm. and we did the snap divas. Oh, yes. Yeah, is it that one? That's right. Okay. <laughs> right, so often African American men and the ways yeah. in which they engaged in their drag personas would, and that was a way of reading somebody, right? Like, be careful of me, I have energy, right? This one. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so Frank actually hung out at a lot of um, African-American mm -hmm. bars and Hispanic bars in San Francisco and uh, watched the drag shows until he became a snap queen. And this was a gesture for him that was like, in your face. And Frank was very in your face in many ways. So when I made the performance, I, I did a whole section in which I um, did a biographical element of him uh, uh, saying, I want to be a dancer, and I just saw fame, so I can do it, right? I can do it. <laughs> yeah, okay, whatever. Um, and then um, he actually uh, was thrown out of his house because he was queer, and his father came to his house with a gun and threatened to kill himself, and Frank just basically said, go ahead, <laughs> do it. And I basically perform it, like this anxiety, like he's being really brash, but he's actually really anxious at the same time. So I use the snap in a different way. And then um, there's another point in which he goes to Luigi in New York, right, the famous Luigi Jazz uh, studio, and he was like watching this, and he became the snap queen, this kind of thing. So he was sort of, in some way, maturing in himself. And at the end of the, the session where I talk about the, the incoherent coherence, at the very end, he literally says to me in the, in the interview, he says, it's over, meaning the interview. I don't want it to be over. And at the end, I just go, because that's how quick his life was. Mm -hmm. So that the metaphor of this, of this um, simple gesture had what we would call polysemous. It's polysemous. It's multiple meaning. Mm -hmm. making. And I think that in using that gesture, which is familiar in different ways, I was able to uh, address many aspects of Frank's character and the narrative elements of his work. So, so that would be another example. Great. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I would love to see that. Yeah, mm -hmm. Frank. I like being Frank Paul. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. I see you're collapsing. Oh, I am. <laughs>